I don't think that I have to say anything about these three gentlemen and one who's going to join us on video because they have been exemplars, citizens, friends, family members, some of them close to me as family. Right, Ralph? Right. Right. <laughs> um, but first, let me congratulate each one of you for this very well-deserved honor. Uh, very well-deserved uh, because you have been such shining lights throughout your life. And while none of you are as old as I am, uh, you have already, <laughs> oh, come on. Uh, you have exceeded my wildest dreams about people that I grew up with and knew. And so it is such an honor to be here with you. And I want to also at this moment thank Georgia Tech and Ivan Allen Fund for recognizing the work that you have done. Because as we've just heard in our previous panel, these are difficult times. And I think that one of the things that inspires me and gives me hope is to know that we have been here before. And thanks to people like you, we have gotten to where we are today. Even with all of the problems that we have, we wouldn't be here had it not been for you and people like you. So let me just start with a quick question. And that is, Ralph, we can start with you. At what point did you begin to focus on college? And when and why during that process did Georgia Tech come on your radar? Well, that's a good question, Shelling. I uh, came from a family of uh, college graduates, so uh, going to school was uh, not an issue uh, for me. Um, my parents are teachers and principals and et cetera in the Atlanta public school systems. Uh, my uncles were principals or head of departments and et cetera. So going to school was not an issue. Uh, the issue was uh, the ability to service others in your environment to make sure that they also uh, share some of the capabilities that you had. Uh, when I talked to uh, one of my advisors at Turner High, uh, we began taking tests at my Uncle Francis' house. You were there. Uh, we were testing the SAT test to make sure that uh, we could qualify to go to almost any university in the country. Mm. And we all, uh, Shelley and myself, we probably could go to MIT, or Harvard, or et cetera, because we were prepared, prepared to take these tests. And the uh, challenge of, of integrating the University of Georgia and Georgia Tech were laid on the table at my Uncle Francis' house when we were taking these tests. And, and uh, Wendell Johnson, one of my co-people over here from Turner High, was one of the four people who applied to Tech. Uh, and uh, we, you know, as we said before, we could have gone almost anywhere. I think Charlene went to Wayne University when she started off her career before she went to uh, Georgia. Uh, we I went to, excuse me, we went to Wayne while the uh, case made its way through the courts and we didn't want to lose any time right. in school. So go ahead. Right. Sorry. And, uh, but uh, <clears throat> I had a, a, a tennis scholarship to go to, to Northwestern. Uh, I'm a tennis player, of course, so my, people might know that. And I would have been Martin Reisner's double partner. But uh, we gave up all those uh, opportunities to come to Tech because uh, we were chosen by our community and the business community to, to come here and to, to foster this environment and make sure that others realize that 
the black students could uh, do as well as others. And of course, I, I have to mention that the people you talked about choosing you, who also had come to us at Turner High, um, were a group of black men called the Atlanta Committee for Cooperative Action, or ACCA. And uh, they felt that it had been long, it, it, how, the 54 decision had been in, had been in decided and Georgia was behind mm -hmm. in using it. And that's when they decided that they needed to recruit uh, students like Hamilton and me and, and yourself. So uh, Carl Holman, uh, the others helped me. Um, Jesse Hill. Jesse Hill Jr. who, boy, everything I read about Atlanta history, Jesse Hill <laughs> Jr.'s name is in it. and. And uh, there were others in that group, Dr. Clinton Warner. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had something to lose by doing what they did, but they were committed, right? Right. To making sure that uh, the 54 decision, and you know what's fun, fascinating to me? I ask a lot of young people today about the 54 decision including some teachers, they don't know. They say, the 54 decision? What was that? This was a black teacher in Sarasota, Florida, who said she heard about it, but she didn't know what it meant. Which, let's go back at some point to discussing this whole issue of critical race theory and black history, but we don't have to go there right now. <laughs> so, sorry, I just, didn't mean to interrupt, but I had to. Well, Lawrence, are you passing or you want me to continue? Uh, but like Charlene said, this is a, a, a family affair. We were, were picked out uh, from our high school classes. We were uh, chosen from a scientific environment. We were probably the first blacks to go into the National Science Foundation. Uh, my first job offer would have been a, a nuclear physicist at uh, the Savannah River plant because I was taking uh, radioisotopes at uh, Knoxville College when I was a, a, a junior in high school. So uh, we were conditioned by the HBCUs in Atlanta and the Pan Atlantic Council, which Charlene alluded to uh, momentarily, that uh, supported, uh, that was supported by the business leagues here, the Urban League, um, uh, National League of Cities, and et cetera. Um, and, and ironically, um, as we talk about this uh, award, uh, my sisters were arrested uh, in the city in 61. And Carolyn uh, and Wilma. And Wilma, you know. And um, my mother, told my father, say, go get them R.A. She called them R.A. because I was right out then. But uh, <laughs> there, from my father going down and putting up his home to uh, make sure that the students, his daughters, first of all, and the rest of the students were not uh, serving a lot of time in prison, uh, Ivan Allen, who was the mayor then, and uh, the police chief Jenkins, uh, reached out to the community, black and white, to have them put up their homes to make sure that none of the kids were spending any time in, in prison. Mm -hmm. So we had a very large cabin, you know, line of kids going in, doing sit-ins, and then coming back home and going back to school again. Mm -hmm. But of course, I just have to add this little bit. Carolyn and Wilma in prison, and the grown-ups, your father, right. among others, said that they needed to get out. So they went and negotiated a way out. Well, your sister, Carolyn, refused to go <laughs> because the men were in one place, the women were in another place. And she said, what's Dr. King doing? They said, oh, he's going to. She says, well, I'm not going till he goes. So they go and they get Dr. King. They bring him to Carolyn. And he says, okay, let's go. She said, we're going. He said, yeah, we're going. They get to the door. He pushes Carolyn out because he ain't going nowhere. 
right. <laughs> and closes the door. And that was when they sent Dr. King to Reedsville Prison in the back of a car, in the back of a police car with a growling dog. Now that's, I just want you to know that the context in which these young people were acting was vicious, was really vicious. And it was Robert Kennedy who called and got um, Dr. King out of Reedsville yeah. Prison. Mm -hmm. But like politics, John F. Kennedy didn't want to offend the Southern Democrats. So he called Coretta and <laughs> said, everything's gonna be all right, but that was the end of that. So, you know, politics don't change that much. Well, did I say that? No. Anyway, <laughs> thank you, Ralph. Thank you. We'll come back to you in a minute. Now, before we get to you, Lawrence, um, we have Mr. Ford Green, who couldn't be with us today in person, but he has sent us a message. The question really is, we had no choice. Uh, we were raised to do that. What we brought to this institution, uh, because of Jim Crow, uh, we were taught in high school by uh, teachers who had masters and PhDs. Uh, the curriculum was more college oriented than uh, high school. Uh, and uh, we had, all of us had outstanding academic achievements as well as sports and, and the arts. Arts are very important. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> My mother was an English teacher, so. <laughs> uh, and, and my objective was to dispel several myths. Number one, uh, black kids could not uh, stand up to the rigors of, of academic uh, challenge at Georgia Tech. Keeping in mind that uh, for all white students, if you were a white male and had a C average in high, any high school in the state, you were automatically admitted. Think about that for a while. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that was, uh, well, anyway, but uh, so we, we had, a, we, we had a, a very rigorous high school education that was well beyond anything in any other uh, white institution. That's a pretty amazing statement. <laughs> and it brought to mind Hamilton. One of the reasons I think he didn't make <laughs> any friends was because before he got to University of Georgia, uh, the highest mark on a test was 50 or 60. And that would have been an A. Hamilton put it up to 98, and they hated him not so much because he was black, but because he was brilliant. <laughs> and uh, that helps to have you understand um, what was going on with the black students in those days. Um, Lawrence? Yes, ma'am. Tell me about when you began to focus on college and why during that process did Georgia Tech come into your vision? Well, that's a very interesting topic for me to talk about because I was at Booker T. Washington. Oh, that's too I, bad. Well, big part. <laughs> I know where you got <laughs> But, you know, they were our enemies, like UTA uh, <clears throat> and Tech. But anyway, I wasn't focusing on going to Tech. I was trying to be a, a top musician. So I was trying to get a scholarship to Tennessee State. I actually went up there twice in the band festival and took first chair in trombone section. Because they that had a really great band. Pissed them off. Mm -hmm. I also beat the people at Turner, too, in the state band festival. <laughs> Not bragging. You didn't anyway, have to say that, didn't the you? The counselors at Washington, Mr. Gaines, specifically, I think, is the one that said, look, I want you to apply to some other colleges. I remember Case Institute of Technology, and I remember applying to Tech, and there was another school, I'm trying to remember which one it was now. 60 years is a long time for us old brains. But anyway. No excuses. 
I had no idea that I was going to be accepted at Tech, right? And I'm still trying to get a music scholarship. All of a sudden, we get the letter saying, you're accepted, and your picture's on the paper, and everybody said, oh, you're going to Tech. And I'm thinking, am I? <laughs> so it was a very quick turnaround, you know. And at that point, I had no idea about what major to try for anything. I, I finally decided electrical engineering. I just kind of picked it out of the hat. You know. Hindsight, <clears throat> excuse me there, hindsight would have said aeronautical engineering, because today that's where I love, and my love is actually. But um, I came in as a student. Now, I want you to understand, there were things happening then, racially, in the city, in the state, that a lot of people have already talked about. Um, one of the things I think a lot of you are not aware of <clears throat> is that when we were first announced, the United Clans of America came right at us, and I do mean right at us. And so I don't know what calls they got, but our telephone, I lived in government housing project, my phone started ringing immediately with threats, mm. and they were not nice. So I lived for most of that year with my phones tapped, uh, sitting in front of our apartment. We lived on a main street on Greens Ferry, right across from Spelman. There were agents parked there almost that entire year, first year, starting in the summer, watching our apartment. We were followed to school. We had to meet. Over, over across the street, at what is now the alumni house, which was the Y then. <clears throat> and they planned out how we could get things rolling here at Tech. And everything went well because you guys did a good job. You guys meaning Georgia meaning Tech. Tech. Right. You hear that, Mr. President? Yeah. Okay, just make sure. <laughs> I mean, nobody was allowed on that campus for a long time if they didn't belong there. And even though we were guarded, they were plain clothes people. In the spring, we were still being watched very closely. And we started in September. Now, of course, there were, you know, a few little minor things that happened. I never set foot in the tech library that I can recall. When my classes were over, I went straight home. Hmm. No social life on campus other than when all of us rats, you know, with the little cap and all, had to do things as a group. You know, we go to a football game or a concert or something. That was our only social life. So campus life for us was a little different. And now you mentioned a couple of people. One of my mentors back then was a guy named Jesse Hill Jr. Mm. and a young lady, John Dale Johnson. Mm. And, uh, John Dale got me involved in NAACP and the Young Democrats. And so I became an activist actually before I came to Tech. And then after I got here, I took a quarter off and I worked in politics for a whole quarter, ran a political office and actually did politics. I mean, really did it at the age of 19. Mm. And so I had to learn to organize. I had to learn to deal with adults. I was the youngest person in my office. I was an office manager. And believe it or not, what I learned at Tech, I took public speaking here, I took urban sociology. <laughs> Those are two things that stay with me today. Now, when I got a little bit further on, I never got to be a tech engineer. You know, that's my dubious distinction, but I have to live with that. But I ended up going into the Air Force for four years, and I slipped home one time because the assignment I had overseas was so technical that the stuff that I was hating here, dealing with the tech, I came and got my books and took them back overseas to Southeast Asia. <laughs> and I needed them. I worked with 
civilian engineers in the Air Force in two different assignments and was even assigned to come back to a defense contractor for two weeks in Texas to fix their systems that they were having problems with. So I never became an engineer, but I was an analyst. So what I learned here taught me what, a lot to help me in life. Now, the good thing about that is I spent a quarter of a century in some career I want to keep quiet called broadcasting. You know. <laughs> anyway. You think you're going to offend me? <laughs> <laughs> right. But anyway, I was able to bring some other people in and I got the respect of my chief engineer. I was in the engineering department. I was the only person of color there when I got there. And it was an interesting time because everybody's looking at me and saying, oh, you must have got here because they just need to add a little color. So I had to prove myself. And guess who I worked with first? Tech students who were part-timers. Some really sharp engineers at tech. First time I came back on campus was with one of my coworkers. I climbed the radio tower that used to be on top of the double E building one night in the radio station, do some repairs. And so I learned a lot about engineering after I left school. Now, my start of my career in the Air Force was very interesting because I didn't tell anybody I went to tech when I got in the Air Force. <laughs> I aced all the exams, so I ended up going to electronic school up in Illinois. And guess what? I was the only person to cut, well, not the only one. I was the only black person there. The only other person of color was a Mexican, my best friend. There was one black instructor in the entire school, and it was a three or four story building the size of Washington High, if you've seen it. Hundreds and hundreds of students. So the entire time I was in school, no other black students were there. And something unique happened. When I got there, the curve was like that, like you said. After about a week, it moved. After a month, it was in the 90s. And it stayed there the entire time I was there. Came to midterm. I'm going home. And I'm going, wow, I get to go home, see my girlfriend, see my family. I actually failed one of my midterm exams. <laughs> they sat me down. They didn't tell me I failed. I didn't realize what had happened. Questioned me, said, would you like to take the test over? And I'm sitting there and dumbfounded, what's going on? Finally, they explained to me, and I said, well, what would happen if I don't take it over? They said, well, your average will drop maybe a couple of points. I said, no, I don't want to go on. So when I graduated from that electronic school, Historically, I was the top student. They sent a letter to my parents stating that. I didn't even know about that. <laughs> so, bad news. We're gonna keep the top student as an instructor. Now, any of you know, no field experience does not make a good teacher, right? I wanted to get out in the field. I wanted to understand something before I tried to teach it. So. My best friend, the Mexican guy from Texas, he wanted to stay there, I wanted to leave. So we went to the commandant and made a deal. He let him stay, he let me go, because he was number two, right behind me. Mm. And I, had, I was so afraid they were gonna keep me that I put in for every combat assignment you could find in the Air Force, thinking that that would help me get out of there. So when they finally said, you can go, I'm so scared, I said, now they're gonna send me to the worst base in the Air Force. No, they sent me to the best bomb wing in the Air Force. So I got to learn on the B-52s that were built starting the year I started at Tech, and those are the ones that are still flying today. Wow. 60 years later. And they predict they'll be flying to 2050. Mm. So, Spent one year there, I learned the B-52 from nose to tail. You know it's called the big, ugly, fat fella, right? 
those, bom those bombers were only loaded with nuclear ordnance, eight of them at a time. For 20, well, a quarter of a century, they flew what we call chrome dome. I don't know if you remember the Cold War, but I had to work on the nuclear bombers. I was offensive system special analyst. Eight of them would always be in the air from some base, always. Eight would be on standby, on the ground, on alert. So for a year, that's what I dealt with. And when I mastered the B-52, I mean, really knew the entire aircraft, not just my systems and equipment. I learned everything. I got reassigned, sent to Omaha, Nebraska, SAC headquarters, totally retrained, spent two years with spy planes with no armament. So I got punished for what I knew. That's what I call it. But um, after I got out of the military, came back to Atlanta, ended up in the honorable, dishonorable professional broadcasting, spent quite a bit of time there. One of my interesting assignments was, as a senior engineer, to be in charge of a football game at some stadium on this campus over there. Yeah, which way, <laughs> I don't know which way to point. But um, that was one of my assignments. Another one, ironically, I was engineer in charge of the first three Martin Luther King broadcasts and did a lot of interesting stuff, met a lot of interesting people, uh, learned a lot. One thing I can tell you that tech taught me, I learned to study more so after I left here <laughs> because the failures that I had here made me promise never to let it happen again. So right now, I'm my own librarian. I have thousands of books. I lived in a library even when I was overseas. That helped me to move up. When I got in broadcasting, I went back downtown to the library and I stayed there and I got promoted twice because I didn't settle for what somebody was teaching me on the job. Mm -hmm. And so I brought, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I brought uh, one tech student in who was here working on his master's and got him a job on my recommendation. And then he was hired away by the CIA and eventually came back to Atlanta and became the head of the dual degree engineering program, mm -hmm. which ushered a lot of and us into the tech system over the years. Oh, we, we finished. And ironically, my mother ended up working there too. So it was like, I'm seeing tech again. Now, I was here for homecoming, revelation time. Harrison Square, I could walk through there years ago. There were no statues there then, but I remember going back and forth through there many times. Never saw anybody look like us. Homecoming day, there was a solid wall that looked like us before the game. That was, <clears throat> that was a revelation for me. In 60 years, I would never have imagined that 60 years ago, that that could be the scene that I could see today. I thought I was on an HBCU campus for a minute, <laughs> really. And so mm. it made me feel good for a change right then. The only problem is every time I've been here, Tech loses the football game. <laughs> so well, can't I can't do anything about that. I have to say that um, listening to you I think about what I'm seeing on television these days about Ukraine and the people who look like you who are on television telling us what's happening. You made that possible, I'm sure. I'm sure. Some of them look like they could be related, are they? Never mind. <laughs> Thank you so much. Let's go to the final uh, 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 person here to talk about his experience at uh, at Georgia Tech, and just very briefly, because I do want to get to some audience questions, but I want you to have your time. What was it that caused you to be interested in, in Georgia Tech, which must not have had that many black people at the time? 
There were none at the time. When I <laughs> none, none, that's not many. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I grew up less than a mile from here. It was over in what was called the Fifth Ward. Very rough neighborhood. And uh, my father, uh, it, it was always uh, understood that we were going to college. All of my brothers and sisters, everybody understood. That was, didn't have to be stated. My father was a postman, and uh, he opened up a shoe shop where we started working when we were uh, in grade school. I had my first job at seven years old. But anyway, we lived next door to uh, Mr. James Whitehead, who was the athletic trainer at Georgia Tech. And uh, they called him Puerto Rico Whitehead, but he tra traveled with the team. But to jump ahead, we, uh, I had always, we had engineers in my family, engineers and scientists, so that was one of my first uh, ideas was to get an engineering degree, go into science. And I was at Booker T. Washington High School, and Aww. we we actually populated Turner with teachers. When, team, when Turner was built, and they recruited the best teachers from Washington <laughs> High School. One of, my sister was a teacher at Washington High School. I mean, at uh, Turner. At Turner? Who? At Turner. Who uh, was your sister? J.Y. Gay. Of course. Gay. Yeah. So what I did was uh, uh, I, I went on up through high school, and I started and at about the, uh, about the uh, 11th grade, I saw an editorial in the Atlanta Journal, which was the evening newspaper, and it was the more conservative of the two newspapers. Mm. Atlanta Constitution was a more liberal paper in the morning. But anyway, we, um, they had an editorial that said when Charlene and Hamilton went to Turner, or went to the uh, University of Georgia, that it would be at least 20 years before Georgia Tech would graduate an African American. They said they're just not ready here. And it certainly won't be a native. It'll be somebody from up north. So I took that as a personal challenge to try to help do something about it. When I went through uh, my senior year at Booker T. Washington High School, the 11th grade, I won the Atlanta-wide Atlanta science fair. And I was the president of the student government. And my, I was a member of the National, um, the, the national Science, uh, I forget it now, 80-year-old reign. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway. Um, I know about that. I, uh, I applied to Georgia Tech. I graduated one year behind Charlene and um, Charlene and, and, and Hamilton, mm -hmm. and I graduated with uh, uh, and my SATs were over over 1,500 total. Mm -hmm. Georgia Tech was accepting much lower scores than that. I applied my senior high school, 1960, uh, 19, I finished in 1960, mm -hmm. so I applied for that senior year. They called and asked me what, um, no, they, they sent a letter that said you need to have a three recommendations from alumni. You need to have uh, you know, writ written recommendations and there was a form for it. And they said you need to send us a transcript. The, when I sent the transcript from Booker T. Washington High School, I didn't hear another word. So I uh, went to Morehouse uh, right after graduation and at Morehouse, I started participating in the demonstrations, sitting in, picketing, walking up and down the picket lines. I st sort of uh, really scared my parents with some of the things that, that happened. They were really vicious, number of violent mm -hmm. things that happened in downtown. And um, They sort of protected me. They said, you applied to Georgia Tech, didn't you? And they asked me, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to apply again. So I applied again. I came over for the interviews. This time was a little different because I talked to Jesse Hill. Mm. But anyway, I was rejected this time. I was there with a group of about 12 or 13 students, and it included the gentlemen that were accepted. They, the three that were accepted, we were happy for them, and we were proud of them, and they did a great job, we thought, of uh, you know, the whole community was so proud of these guys. They, they, they really uh, were facing some difficulties, and we knew that. So 
I was called by Mr. Carmichael, who was the uh, registrar, and he asked, he asked, what are you going to do? And I told him, I'm going to apply again. I don't know why. We wrote a joint letter to President Harrison that said, we don't understand why we were rejected. Mm -hmm. We had profiles of all those 13 students that were all in uh, higher, uh, had high grade point averages. They were all, um, uh, I guess, standouts in their schools and their, and their accomplishments. So he sent a letter back that said, this is unprecedented, but I've, I've had asked Mr. Carmichael to contact each of you who was rejected and try to respond. So my mother and I went over. My mother said, I'm going to to talk to Mr. Carmichael about it. And, and we went over and talked about it and discussed it. He said, we have this computer program that says you'll never succeed at Georgia Tech. And uh, I said, I thought our SAT scores were higher than average. And he said, yeah, they are, but that's not the whole story. <laughs> and he said, um, so what are you doing now? I said, I'm at Morehouse, Morehouse student. He didn't know then at the time we were demonstrating and we were being picketed, we were picketing and um, causing good trouble. So, um, good trouble. <laughs> yes. And we were starting to negotiate with the city structure about how to solve those problems. We were taught nonviolence. You do, do not go down there. And uh, you had to pledge, write a pledge that you would not be violent. You would not respond violently to any confrontations. So we did a number of things like that. And, and one of the most dangerous things, Lonnie King had acid thrown on him at one time. And we had just come back into the office. We after demonstrating at a West Side location and decided he would, um, we were going to um, keep the picket line up. But to fast forward ahead, I applied to Georgia Tech the third time and I got my degree. I finished uh, after three really tough years. Uh, there was hostility. There were a number of things out, and I just won't go into a lot of detail. The threats and things that happened. We, I still to this day don't don't dignify some of the things that happened because they will know that people will think there was an effect to it. But um, uh, we, I, I did uh, job that never got easier as we went through, as I got to my senior year, there was an incident that I was told, you're not gonna make it, it's been decided, you're not gonna get this. So I had to take extra exams and afterwards. I found out I finally finished in the upper third of the class. But uh, I was told, you're not gonna make it. And there were, um, I don't know, there were a number of things. I, just too many things to cite. But I've always been grateful to Georgia Tech and I've always been happy with what they're doing, and I've always been taught to think strategically. Think about this. There are a number of African-American students who are needed by this country. Mm. They are needed by this country for its security and growth, and that's what, uh, believe it or not, we had a visit from Senator Herman Talmadge to speak to the campus. I sat on the front row. <laughs> I had a few questions for him. He used to campaign using the n-word on radio and television so I sat on the front row to ask him questions he was clearly his topic was we need all engineering for national security we need to the schools uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the schools contributions those contributions I had some questions well what about why is there so many people not here why are you campaigning to keep those people out. And the other thing is that another thing that I'm grateful for, for Georgia Tech, is that I understand there have been about 8,000, at least 8,000 African American graduates since I was here. Mm. And do you know that according to George Washington University Education, each degree adds an average of $2.7 million to that person's salary. If you think strategically, that's over $23 billion going into the African-American community. That's what I call thinking strategically. Mm. Okay. So.
Well, it's really amazing. Uh, as, we, as we welcome the president, I would just like to conclude this session by saying I had another question, uh, which I don't have time to ask, but I think that the answer to that question is totally obvious from the sessions that we've had today. I was often asked, um, am often still, every now and then somebody asks me a question, um, about my courage uh, to go to the University of Georgia. And I say, it wasn't courage, it was determination. And I was going to ask these gentlemen about courage, but I've heard the answer. It was determination. Thank you. You are so deserving of this honor, and I am honored to sit here with you and those with whom I sat earlier today, as well as with all of you. Thank you so much for being who you are. A huge thank you to our moderator. A huge thank you to, um, to the three of you and to our friend Ford, who I'm sure it's uh, rolling his eyes from whatever he is, and he would correct some of the record here. Um, let me, just to, to put in perspective um, what these gentlemen contributed to. Um, the largest city in our state, of course, is Atlanta. The second largest, some people will contest that, right? Columbus, Augusta. For the sake of argument, allow me to claim Augusta as the second largest city. The two largest cities in our states are currently led by Georgia Tech alums, both of them African-American. The largest university in our state, despite of the introduction from a moderator who got a little bit carried away with her passion for uh, this college in Athens, uh, is, is actually Georgia State University. The largest university in our state is led by Georgia Tech alum, also an African-American, Dr. Brian Blake, who you have met earlier this morning. In fact, in the country, there are a little over 140 universities that are considered R1, that are considered very high research universities. This is the highest classification of research universities, a little over 140. Four of them, four of those universities, it's so almost 3% of those, are led by Georgia Tech alums. You're looking, yeah. You're looking at one of them, and you're looking at the only non-black of them. The other three, Dr. Gary May, president of UC Irvine, Dr. Brian Blake, president of Georgia State University, and this is Georgia Tech honorary alum, Reggie DeRoche, uh, president of Rice University. <laughs> just, just put that in perspective, um, what has happened in the last 60 years. And we know it wasn't easy, and we know it was painful, and we know it took courage and determination, and that there would have been other more fun options for an 18, 19, 20-year-old uh, to enjoy their, their youth. But what you did changed not just this institution, but changed our nation for the better. And for that, we will be forever grateful. Thank you so very much.